In this module, I'm going to talk about the certification process for individuals and companies that are going to be performing NDT on aircraft and aircraft components. So the FAA has issued guidance and advisory circular AC 65-31B, uh, which pertains specifically to the training, qualification, and certification of non-destructive inspection personnel. And it's kind of, it has two parts uh, for personnel, the individuals, that, where it discusses things like required experience, training, what kind of qualification someone has to hold for various forms of NDT, what kind of examinations they need to take under undergo in order to become qualified or become certified. The second part of it is it also includes the recommendations for uh, organizations where non-destructive testing needs to be done on aircraft or equipment uh, that they are responsible for operating. And so this includes you know, any organization, particularly things like part 121 carriers, or MROs that are going to be servicing various air carriers uh, need to have some kind of a written program that is developed by the by the organization and approved by the FAA. Uh, that's going to include things like uh, what methods are going to be, you know, what methods are part of the program and how employees and technicians are going to be trained and qualified and certified in order to perform. NDT under NDI under that organization's umbrella. And so between the two of those, it's it's going to cover the, you know, the organization and the individuals that work for the organization. Uh, and this, this advisory circular is going to reference various, uh, various parts of the FARs and the, uh, the federal regulations, um, as well as you know, provide clarification in areas that where maybe the FARs don't spell things out uh, in detail, but more provide an outline framework. So when we start to look into this, what does that mean for non-destructive testing, non-destructive inspection, non-destructive evaluation, whether you want to call it NDT, NDI, or NDE, uh, is that certification is performed for, for NDT at the company level. Uh, and so it's not a federally recognized certification or a national certification or even a state level certification, but rather when individuals show they meet the requirements of that NDT program that's part of an organization. Uh, and that NDT program uh, often can be part of the uh, standard operating procedures and it's typically part of the maintenance standard practices. Um, but the certification one receives as a practitioner of NDT is going to be based around that. And so the, the certification will be granted by that company to say that somebody has met the training and certification requirements of that organization, of the program that that organization has developed. And this is particularly the case of companies that have extensive NDT in-house programs. And so organizations where they're going to per be performing a significant amount. So again, this goes to those things like airlines, cargo operators, uh, or companies that service airlines and cargo operators or other fleet operators, uh, where they're going to have a critical mass of aircraft uh, that are going to require inspection on a regular enough basis that it makes sense to have employees in the organization who are, uh, who are NDT qualified. And so that will, that'll list out their training and certification program. Um, that also will include a, an element of experience in OJT because for most, most, if not all NDT methods, there is a experience portion of the certification of the minimums needed for certification. Uh, that in-house program is going to include documenting and record keeping, uh, both of the inspections performed as well as of the program itself and making sure that everything is in compliance 
and that the organization and certified individuals are performing NDT in the manner that they say they're going to. And then uh, it also is going to lay out how NDT, certi NDT technicians are going to be certified within that internal certification program. For smaller organizations, organizations, aviation organizations that use NDT occasionally, they're typically going to outsource most of their NDT program uh, to do all the elements that were talked about for the large organizations on the previous slide. Uh, takes a significant amount of management time, uh, record keeping effort and ultimately cost. And so if you have a smaller organization where certain forms of NDT aren't going to be performed all that often, or you aren't operating a large number of aircraft and that as a result, aren't going to be performing every type of NDT or certain types of NDT that often, uh, rather than having in-house practitioners companies are going to still oftentimes need to have an NDT program as part of their uh, standard operating procedures, but it could be a program for the management of outside contractors that actually are gonna perform NDT on an as needed basis. And so in this case, the, the NDT program has to include uh, a way to verify training and certification of the individuals who may not work for that company, but rather for a third party that they're going to be contracting out to. Uh, included in that is the verification of experience and on the job training and then documentation and record keeping. So now it falls to both organizations, both the organization that that's the operating the aircraft or that's doing the overhaul or the maintenance on the components. Uh, where the NDT is going to be performed or on whose components the NDT will be performed on. But then the company with the contract employees who are performing the NDT, they have to, they're responsible for documenting and record keeping, you know, the, the things like ver like training, certification, experience, so that they can provide that verification to whoever they're being contracted to. And so they work hand in hand in order to do this. In order to put one of these certification programs together, even though there isn't a, a national certification or there isn't a national license or even a state certification, the certification programs have to have some kind of evidence or framework to, to base things around. And so most certification programs, they're gonna typically use one or more national or international standards that has been developed uh, in order to qualify their NDT program. And so these, these standards that are put together by, by yet another set of organizations uh, are gonna have qualification that includes, this is where those, those Formal classroom instruction requirements are defined and come into play, where the experience is defined, you know, how much experience someone needs, what kind of written exams or practical exams someone may need to perform in order to become, to say they're certified or qualified. Uh, and this is very, very common that the uh, outside organization is used for this testing and certification. Very few organizations build a entire NDT program from the ground up without referencing some kind of uh, standard from one of these national or international uh, standards companies. So some of the ones you know, that are commonly used, the outside agency, here the employer, uh, the company that that operates and owns the aircraft has the ultimate responsibility for authorizing the performance of NDT, but they're going to be turning a lot of the responsibility for ensuring training is done and people are qualified to an outside agency. Uh, and even if they have their own in-house and even if the people doing the NDT are direct, are employees of the, of the, the organization who owns and operates the aircraft, if they've been trained by an outside agency, then that outside agency, you know, is is who has done the certification 
and verifies that the person has the knowledge and skills to perform MBT. So the, the employer, the, the operator of the aircraft is going to put that responsibility to administer written and practical exams and issue certificates and ensuring the knowledge and skill is there on that outside agency, on that third party. Uh, organization that specializes in certifying individuals to perform non-destructive testing and non-destructive inspection. So all of these, whether a whether an NDT program is fully in-house or is some kind of a combination of in-house and third party or is fully done by third parties, uh, the standards that many of these organizations are going to use are going to be ones that are have been found acceptable uh, by the FAA. So the FAA itself really doesn't write very many non-destructive testing or inspection standards. They defer to uh, several professional organizations and engineering societies and standards organizations that are uh, geared more heavily towards testing or towards the engineering and testing side of things. So, so here's a small list of them. So Aerospace Industries Association, um, Air Transport Association, we've seen a lot of things where ATA and things like ATA codes are used. Well, this is ATA spec 105. Specification 105 has to do with NDT. Uh, another big one is the American Society for Non-Destructive Testing, ASNT, who puts out all kinds of different standards and qualification requirements. Um, ISO, International Organization for Standards, is a worldwide standardization organization that sets standards in all different industries, all different practices, but among other things, they, they provide standards for NDT, known as ISO 9712. Uh, military standard, U.S. military standard, mil spec or mil standard uh, 410E, delves into non-destructive testing. And then the Canadian national regulations, um, there, are, there are regulations in Canada that, that oftentimes other uh, nations that are you know, similar in the world to Canada, including the United States, many European nations will refer back to the Canadian national regulations as well, just like Canada will refer to many of these organizations, including things like MIL standard, which is a United States standard, American Society for Non-Destructive Testing, ASNT is a, is a United States based organization, Air Transport Association, United States is a worldwide organization. So uh, these, these, there's many different sources and all kind of brought together to create the standards that, that create the non-destructive testing framework. Uh, in the in the aviation industry and in the rest of the world. And they cover essentially any method that's commonly used in use today. And so in aviation, this includes things like radiography, you know, all different forms, X-ray, gamma, CT, or neutron. Uh, they cover magnetic particle inspection, ultrasonic inspection, liquid penetrant inspection, eddy current testing, thermography, and other infrared testing methods, as well as uh, acoustic emission, microwave and millimeter wave testing, leak testing, which leak testing can be as simple as looking for leaks. Uh, they define a drip, a drop, a weep, and a seep, for instance. Uh, what are those and how much those mean for leak testing to observe leaking? The various forms of laser testing, including holography, sheerography, and profilometry, and then any other method used by an organization, although this list has covered the vast majority that will be seen in the aviation industry. So for each method, though, as a practitioner of NDT, uh, there's separate certification for each method. So in order to perform a specific NDT method uh, on a, in, a, in an organization, one must have to be, must be certified in that specific method. 
that certification starts with a general understanding of all the methods that are covered by an organization's NDT program. But knowing what an organization does and kind of the whole picture doesn't uh, doesn't bring somebody to the point where they can actually perform NDT in that organization. So beyond that, then actual certification and the level of certification by level, there's uh, certifications are typically broken into three levels, level one, two, and three. So certification and level is then granted to an individual on a method by method basis. So even though a, a organization may have three or four, five, six, seven, eight different NDT methods listed uh, in their NDT program as an individual, someone may only be certified in one or two, or someone whose primary job is inspection and testing may be certified in all methods that a company uh, that a company has authorization to perform. Um, however, they you know, will also need to keep all those different methods current. And in addition to that, individuals have to pass basic vision tests uh, to qualify for any method. And these are both acuity, being able to sense, you know, see, see things clearly, and color perception. Uh, because several NDT methods have a certain level of being need to differentiate colors or shades. Uh, and so individuals have to pass that basic vision test on a annual or yearly basis uh, in order to maintain their certification. And just kind of as a side note here, just the color perception, uh, just because someone has some level of color blindness does not necessarily mean they can't perform NDT. Uh, we'll look at the, the color tests here in a minute, and you can kind of see how someone may not have perfect color vision, but, but uh, good enough to, to be, be able to pass these this basic vision test. So when we look at acuity and color, so visual acuity tests determine the smallest uh, letters that you can read on a standardized chart known as a Snellen chart or a card held at 60 feet sorry, 20 feet, six meters away. Um, these, most people have probably seen at an eye doctor or something like that, as you can see here on the right. And, and this is where we get the term like 2020 vision, where many people are, are in our 2020 vision. Um, what that is, is you can see the line eight here on the chart is labeled 2020. That's, uh, that is, so the first 20 is the distance of 20 feet. And then the second 20 refers to the size or point of the lettering. So uh, line eight is someone with, that's considered uh, perfect vision is 2020 can see that row eight, that line eight at 20 feet away when it's the 20 point font. Uh, now, even though you know, 2020 is considered perfect in the, uh, NDT world, an individual has to have near vision, at least one eye, and that means that they don't have to even have perfect vision in both eyes, but rather they have to have one eye that has a minimum uh, vision acuity of 2025, and that can be corrected or uncorrected. So you have to have a minimum of, of 2025 in one eye. Uh, even if you, you know, while wearing glasses. So if you normally wear glasses, you would wear glasses to perform this eye test. Uh, you don't have to be able to pass it without some kind of eyeglasses on. And it'll be uh, rechecked annually. And, and just to ensure that someone has the visual acuity to be able to perform NDT and see, see the flaws that they're expected to be able to find. The second part of the acuity test or the, of, of the vision test is the color portion. And this is measuring the ability to tell the difference among colors. So 6531B says distinguish, you have to be able to distinguish and differentiate between colors necessary for the inspection method for which qualification is sought. And so where this is important is in many NDT methods, color, being able to see color isn't nearly as important. Something like a, um, ultrasound test machine or an eddy current tester uh, 
the the color you know you just need to be able to see the screen because sometimes screens are only in black and white especially some of the older instruments out there uh, but you know things like liquid penetrance and magnetic particles where you have to see colored or fluorescent dyes or powder you have to be able to determine that and again someone that's colorblind to a certain extent may still be able to see uh, these the color perception have enough color perception that they can still perform the tests without a problem. So there's kind of two ways that this is completed once most people's color perception doesn't change over time. Uh, and so when someone's getting initially qualified, they're going to have to either pass an Ishihara test or a yarn test. And uh, many people have seen the Ishihara test before. Here's an example of one. So Ishihara color perception test. And in these various circles, uh, you'll be able to see various uh, letters and or numbers. And certain ones are designed where anybody should be able to see them. Certain ones are designed where someone with what's considered normal color vision can see it, but someone that's colorblind in a certain way may not be able to see it. Uh, some of them are actually designed where someone with normal vision can't see it, but someone that does have certain color blindness would be able to see it. Or some of them are even designed where you know, someone with kind of normal color perception will see one letter or number and certain types of color blindness or color ambiguity will be able to see a different color or number. And so uh, you have to have a key for these and when, when giving the test based on which ones people can see or what they can see in specific ones uh, one can judge if somebody has uh, what's considered normal color vision or if they have some kind of color blindness such as a red green or a yellow yellow green color blindness and so uh, this is one way however and this is where Many people, if they do have some type of color blindness, see this type of test is where they will, uh, where it will be confirmed. You know, they may suspect it, um, but something like this is how it's confirmed and how they how it can be confirmed specifically what type of color blindness an individual may have. The other test type, though, that's acceptable uh, for most methods is what's called a yarn test, and I don't have a good picture of one, but essentially it's this: it's a it's a card with strips of yarn, different color yarn attached across it. And the individual that is having their color perception test basically just has to go down the row and list off what colors they see. Uh, and so for most people, even if they do have certain uh, certain level of color blindness, as long as it's not extreme, uh, they can usually pick this up well enough that that someone can pass you know, even if they do have some mild form of color blindness. So once someone is going to become certified in NDT, there are three levels that they can be certified to. So everyone has to start by becoming certified at level one in the method they're going to do. So you can be certified at different levels and different methods as well. You know, so someone may be certified as a level two or three in a given method, but only a level one in another method, or not certified at all in a different in the third method. So what is an individual allowed to do? Well, level ones can prepare parts. This is cleaning, prep work, removing surface coatings, that kind of thing. They can conduct a test and record the data from that test, and they can make a decision based on clear indications. So, you know, performing part preparation after inspection process. There you have to follow procedures that are pertinent to a specific test, and those procedures will have been developed ahead of time by somebody at a level three. Uh, they're often going to have to, especially in the training portion of becoming certified, receive guidance or supervision from level two or three qualified individuals. And then there's a, a table in AC 6531B, table one, uh, that lists the minimum training experience for various types of NDT. And, and when we're done looking at the levels, then we'll take a look at this at table one of AC 6531B just to kind of get an idea 
of what it takes for different methods. So then the next level someone can move up to is a level two. And uh, this is includes all items for level one. So someone that's that's a level two can do everything a level one can do. But now they're getting more into uh, setting up and standardizing equipment, conducting tests, and then interpreting and evaluating and documenting re results. So a little bit more detailed there. So what does that mean? So all the responsibilities we looked at in detail for level one, um, setting up and standardizing equipment, conducting the test. This includes things like calibration steps uh, beyond just a basic uh, calibration uh, or, you know, or, or qualifying calibration standards. Um, someone that's a level two has to be familiar with the scope and limita limitations of a method, the methods that they're qualified in. They have to have that ability to provide that oversight and that on the job training for people who are trainees, may not certified yet, but becoming certified. And then those that also are already a level one. Uh, in order to do that too, they have to be familiar with the code standards and other regulatory guidelines. Uh, including the standards from those various organizations we looked at earlier uh, that pertain to the the method that they're certified as a level two at. And then again, that same table in AC 6531 table one uh, lists the training and experience guidelines for level two as well. And training and experience guidelines just are our classroom minimum classroom times and minimum time performing uh, NDT methods. And then certification level three, level three is the highest level in, in a given NDT method. And there they can do all level one and two items, but then level three, their their big differentiation is someone who's a level three is going to be the one uh, deciding what type of NDT needs to be done on a part to identify critical failures uh, before they become critical or, or signs of impending failure. Uh, so that includes things like selecting methods and techniques, designing reference standards and selecting them, writing in the test procedures, and then interpreting those regulations. So, so where level two just has to kind of be familiar with the regulation standards and codes, level three is the individual is actually interpreting it and deciding whether a given procedure meets the regulation standards and codes or not. And that's part of that selection and design process uh, for the methods, techniques, and standards. So again, all detailed responsibilities for level one and level two now. Um, selecting the methods and techniques. So, so what is the NDT method that they're a level three in? What, you know, are they qualified? Is that the proper method? What are the techniques? You know, what are the, you know, what kind of probes have to be used? What kind of standards have to be used? Uh, what kinds of dwell times and what types of cleaning has to be done? Uh, and they're selecting all that and designing the equipment, standards, specifications, techniques. And then they have to, before they, before they deploy that, and particularly before they roll it out to the level one and two inspectors, they have to verify the adequacy of these procedures. Uh, and then they're also providing the on the job training and examination of trainees at both for both trainees, level one and level two inspectors. So they're the big part of their job is interpreting code standards and other regulatory guidelines. And as a part of that, uh, they have to have a minimum of four years combined school and work experience in a method and many vast majority of the time, uh, someone who's a level three also tends to be an engineer or have worked in an engineering capacity of some kind of engineering background that includes uh, both the structural engineering as well as material science. Uh, not everyone, not necessarily an engineering degree, but familiarity with, with those things like, like structural engineering and, and the material science side of things. That can be gained though, however, from, uh, you know, other types of schooling or work experience. Uh, so again, they don't have to necessarily be a formally trained engineer, although it's not uncommon to find formally trained engineers at that level three level, at that level three certification level. 
so here's that table I was discussing, table one and AC 6531B that lists, you know, here the, the different common NDI methods. So eddy current, ultrasound, mag particle, penetrant, radiography, thermography, and then other, um, other is kind of a catch-all and there's a note there, five, which, which lists a bunch of the others. But uh, what you can see here is it breaks down each method into classroom instruction and experience at level one and level two. Um, and so something to note here is that he, the level two, uh, any of the level two experience requirements for classroom instruction are hours in addition to the level one hours. So for eddy current example, line one, you know, to get level one in eddy current, someone has to uh, take a minimum of 40 hours of classroom instruction, and then they also need to perform eddy current for a minimum of 480 hours or three months, uh, and then they'll get their level one. And then to become level two, they have to already have that level one. They have to take another, an additional 40 hours of classroom instruction, and then they have to get a total of 1,440 hours or nine months of experience so that that's not in addition to the level one time but it's it's an addition so it would be an additional six months in that case or an additional uh just under a thousand about 960 hours of uh of time and so uh you the uh you know the the classroom off doubles for most for all of these uh, but the the experience that you need to go from a level one to a level two usually is about three times the experience you need. So so the level two experience is three times as much as the level one experience. Uh, the level two classroom is twice the classroom of just a level one practitioner. And so you see some you know different methods have different techniques. So. So magnetic particle and penetrant testing are two of the easiest and take the least amount of time with 16 hours of instruction for level one and one month of experience, you know, and then an additional 16 hours and a total of three months of experience to get to level two. Both of those are fairly straightforward, whereas all the other methods, eddy current, ultrasonic, radiography, thermo thermography, and then others, which hopefully as students in the program and getting to perform essentially all of these except for uh, radiography, you've kind of seen why mag particle and penetrant don't need as much training and, and eddy current ultrasound uh, thermography all need more uh, more time to be proficient at the various levels because they 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 need uh, that you need that additional on the job experience and training in order to become fully proficient at them. So one thing you'll see though, is that level three qualification requirements were not listed on that chart. And that's because these are uh, pretty much the same across the board. And they go back to what I mentioned on the level three, the level three slide. And that is uh, someone who is a graduate of a four-year college or university with a degree in engineering or some kind of a related science, plus a minimum of one year experience as a level two or someone can have completed two years of engineering or related science study at a university, college, or tech school. And so, so someone studying for your AMP does kind of fall into, falls into this category um, of a, as a related uh, science actually can, and for, for, uh, for WMU, it, you fall under the first category of the four-year degree, although you don't have as much of an engineering background uh, but you definitely fall under the second at least two years of related study in a technical school. Plus, then you would need two years of experience as a level two inspector before you could become a level three. Or if someone doesn't have any uh, formal schooling, they can have four years of experience in, uh, in an assignment performing uh, NDT or NDI methods at level two. Uh, in the method that they're going to try to go and become a level three qualified at. And, and with that, you know, in that four years, 
hopefully someone has learned a significant amount about structure and metallurgy, material science, uh, in order to be able to apply that. You know, they've seen enough, they've seen a lot of, of, of inspections taking place and a lot of different, hopefully exposed to flaws and, and what kind of real world uh, examples are out there that, that can allow them to have the experience needed in order to be an effective level three. So even after you've received certification, however, there are requirements that you need to uh, to keep that, and that is you have to recertify on a regular basis. So levels one and two have a recertification required of every three years. Every three years, you have to recertify, typically through a written test plus a practical component. Uh, level three requires certification, recertification every five years again written test practical component um, more extensive than what would be required of a level one or two. However, at any point uh, in time, while someone is a practitioner of various ND NDT methods, uh, their certification can be revoked if uh, they show, you know, they demonstrate unsatisfactory performance. Often what happens in there is someone's temporarily no longer allowed to perform NDT and they receive some kind of uh, retraining or remedial training. Um, other things too is if you're inactive, uh, if you have a, if you don't use a given method in a six month period of time, uh, you would have to kind of recertify. Uh, or if you're no longer able to meet the vision examination limits, or if you've uh, if you've gone more than a year since your last vision examination. Now, in the case of that, uh, with the, the vision examination, uh, that there is no waiting period if you realize that you've, if, you know, if you've gone a year, you know, a year and a day and you realize you need to redo that, you don't have to go back and recertify uh, by taking tests and all that. It's just you have to get your vision, your vision test, vision acuity test, uh, just updated that it's been, that's been performed. So when you wrap this all up, NDT you know, is a qualification, uh, not, a, not a license, um, but a certificate that is uh, tied to a specific employer. And so the question often comes up then is can an individual change employers? And so if you're, if you're qualified to perform uh, specific methods of NDT at an employer uh, at any level, level one, two, or three, uh, and you're going to be changing organizations, what you would want to do is request uh, documentation, including things like training documentation or proof of training, uh, certificates of course completion, as well as evidence of work performed or that you've been performing the NDT methods uh, to take with you whatever an organization will allow. And then the new organization that you're going to, they may deem you grandfathered in to perform NDT at that new organization. So ultimately it is their responsibility to verify and decide if you've met all, you know, all the requirements to hold certification under their NDT program. And so sometimes most organizations, because they fall back on those same standards, uh, Typically, that's not too big of a deal. Maybe there's a little bit of differences training or some information you know about how it's, you know, you'll have to learn how the how the program at a new employer is run and and kind of the general information. But the specific process, you know, knowing how to perform a given NDT method, uh, most of the time organizations are more than happy to grandfather you in uh, because you're it means you're one less person who they have to train. Uh, to have available in order to perform NDT or NDI or NDE. So that wraps up certification. And the next, uh, the next module that we'll be looking at will be uh, a kind of an extension of certification NDT, which is looking at how do we know that we're performing it and how do we decide you know, what we need to be looking for, and it's called probability of detection.